third part in the uh, twofold program of God. And uh, up to this point, <clears throat> we've looked at the creation of God, <clears throat> how he created the heaven and the earth. <clears throat> and we saw the governmental order in heaven and earth, how that he created thrones and dominions and principalities and powers and how the heaven is his throne and the earth is his footstool. And he created these thrones, dominions, and principalities and powers in heaven and earth. Then he created beings, creatures to fill that government and how it was all designed to function under the authority of God. And then we saw Satan's rebellion <clears throat> in Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, that uh, Satan become corrupt in his wisdom because of his pride and how he led a rebellion against God and that his actual plot is to exalt himself in heaven and in earth and to be like the most high God, meaning uh, the possessor of heaven and earth. We saw that God judged the world and uh, destroyed it and then he recreated it and he divided what we looked at the last time was how that the dominion of the earth was separated from heaven uh heaven and earth was was created to be one and yet in the first chapter of genesis we read how that god divided the light from the darkness how he created a firmament to separate the heaven and the earth and then he creates man and gives him dominion over the earth and we're going to start there this morning with with the creation of man and we're going to start going through the old testament <coughs> and looking at what we call prophecy but uh god's plan in colossians 1 20 is uh the Bible says in Colossians 1.20, and having made peace, talking about Christ, how he made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself. Now, when Paul talks about all things there, he's talking about all things that God created in heaven and in earth. And it was found in uh, Colossians 1.16, four verses earlier. That what God had created was thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers. And God has a plan to reconcile all those thrones, dominions, and principalities, and powers to himself by Jesus Christ through the blood of his cross. And Paul says that having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself, he says, by him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And so God has a, God is now going to reconcile all these things back to himself of things in heaven and in earth. And that's what we call the twofold program of God, or the twofold plan of God. Uh, God has a plan to reconcile the things in heaven and the things in earth. And what we call that is mystery and prophecy. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and prophecy, in the, uh, prophecy which has been spoken since the world began. That's Acts. Uh, you can read about that in Acts chapter three, verse twenty-one, <clears throat> and mystery which was kept secret since the world began. Romans sixteen twenty-five. Prophecy is about God's plan to reconcile all things in the earth. And the mystery, which he kept secret, deals with his plan to reconcile the things in the heavens. And so God has a God has an earthly reconciliation plan uh, through the nation of Israel, and he has a uh, heavenly reconciliation plan through the church that he's building today. We call it the church, the body of Christ. <clears throat> and so the reason God is creating the church today, the church you and I belong to, is a part of his plan to reconcile the heavenly places. And this is what he had kept secret until he revealed it to the Apostle Paul.
<laughs> so here on our timeline, we got a timeline, and we're going to be looking at this timeline a lot and adding things to it. But if you just look there at the beginning, that's what God created, the heaven and the earth. And the top line of the timeline, this top line up here at the very top, <clears throat> represents the heavenly plan. And this was a mystery that was hid in God from the beginning. That's uh, Ephesians chapter 3 and verse number 9. Uh, you can read about it, Romans 16, 25. And then this line down here on the bottom is the earth. And this is what God has spoken since the world began. Uh, the very second verse of the Bible in uh, ver Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Verse 2, and the earth was without form and void. And so from Genesis 1, 2 onward, uh, the word of God focuses on the earth and what, what, what God's plan is in the earth and what he was keeping hid. Uh, from ages and from generations was his plan to reconcile the heavenly places. And so right here on our timeline, just know and understand that everything we read in the Old Testament, there's something that's kept hid in God, and it's not going to be revealed until after Christ died on the cross, and it's revealed over there in the New Testament. All right. Now, now we come down to the creation of man. Remember that when man's created, God has already created the heaven and the earth. Uh, he's already destroyed the earth once with water because of Satan's rebellion. So all this stuff had already taken place when he created man. And here in Genesis 1, we read about the creation of man. It says, and God said, let us make man in our image <clears throat> after our likeness. So man's created in God's image. Uh, he's created to be the image of God in the earth. Uh, the Bible calls Christ the image of the invisible God. Well, man was created to be the image of God. Uh, he's created to be God's image in the physical realm. He's, he's created to be uh, the image of the invisible God. And uh, after he's created, God tells you, God tells us uh, that after he creates man, he says, let them have dominion. Now, man's dominion, he's created to have dominion over. Now, notice this, just pay close attention to where man's dominion is. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So man's dominion is defined uh, as over the earth, over the sea, and over the air. Uh, nothing about heaven there. Man has no dominion in the heavenly places in the Old Testament. Uh, if you, I'm going to read you Psalm chapter 8. If you got your Bible, turn to Psalm chapter 8. <clears throat> Psalm chapter 8, verse number 4 says, What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angel, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him, now watch this, thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands, and thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, Yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the seas. And so God made man lower than the angels, but set him over the works of his hands and put all things under his feet. But, but notice the, 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 the definition of man's dominion is it's, it's over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, and over all the beasts of the field. And so man's dominion is over land, sea, and air. Nothing about heaven. Uh, man was not given dominion over the heavenly places. That's Now we know now through the mystery that God has exalted man, seated him in heavenly places, as Paul said in Ephesians 1, 3. 
that he has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, that he quickened us, raised us, seated us together in the heavenly places in Christ, but that's a part of God's mystery. A uh, man was created to have dominion over the earth, not the heaven. And, uh, and so man's created to be God's image in the earth, and he gives that man dominion over the earth, over everything that he created there in Genesis chapter one, but not the heaven. Uh, man's dominion is over the earth. In Genesis 1, we read about man's commission, why he was created. So he creates him, gives him dominion, and now he gives him a commission. Uh, Genesis 1, 28 says, and God blessed them. And God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And so man's responsibility, number one, is to replenish the earth, to be fruitful and multiply in it. <clears throat> the word replenish means to fill up again, meaning the earth had been filled before. In fact, Noah's told the same thing in Genesis chapter 9 after his flood. He's told to replenish the earth, just like Adam was told. And so something was on the earth before man got here. And God creates man in his image and tells him to refill it. And uh, he gives him dominion over it. And his job is to refill the earth, to be fruitful, multiply, and refill the earth. <clears throat> But he's also told to subdue it. Now, the, the word subduing, uh, look over in 1 Corinthians 15. Because Adam, Adam failed at this, and Christ is going to step in and take care of what Adam failed to do. But in 1 Corinthians 15, if you want to understand what subdue means, the Bible tells us over here about Christ, that God hath put all things under his feet. And then it says, but when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the son himself also be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. But uh, let me read you another verse. First Corinthians 15, 24 says, then cometh the end. When he, talking about Jesus Christ, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And so the very fact that Adam is told to subdue the earth, not just to replenish the earth, but to subdue it, that means that there's enemies that must be brought under subjection. And so, and so. Adam is told there to replenish the earth and subdue it, meaning to bring it under subjection to God, to put down all power, all authority, to put all enemies, to bring all enemies under subjection to God. And so Adam has a responsibility. God gives him dominion over this creation, over the earth. And his job is to fill the earth and bring it in subjection to God. And then he tells him, have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So that's why Adam was created. We already know that Satan rebelled. God bound Satan and his darkness under the firmament. And then Adam is created in that new, that dominion of the earth that's now separated from heaven. And his job is to subdue the earth so that it can be rejoined back to heaven. And that's that's what happens at the end of the Bible after Christ steps in and takes care of this thing. But the, the earth is man's dominion. And he, he was to fill it, subdue it uh, to God, bring it in subjection to God. All right. Adam's given a commandment, Genesis chapter two. So that was his commission. Now we look at the commandment. Adam had one commandment. Uh, Genesis 2, 16 through 17, and the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. 
And so Adam's given a commandment to, to not eat. He, he can eat of every tree freely. But there's one tree that God tells him he, he can't eat of. And that tree is called the knowledge of good and evil. And all that means, all that means is that this tree was planted by God to give Adam a knowledge of good and evil. By not eating it, he has knowledge of good, and through obedience, he has life. But that tree also is a knowledge of evil in that through disobedience, Adam will die. And so that, that tree was put there to give this man the knowledge of good and evil. He only had one commandment, don't eat of this one tree. In the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. And so that was Adam's commandment. And uh, I'd love to go into more detail about these things, guys, but we're just simply looking at why man was created. He was created to fill the earth, subdue it to God, and he's given one commandment not to eat of this tree. And so uh, Adam's disobedience now. Uh, Genesis chapter three, verse number six. Y'all know the story. The serpent shows up and deceives the woman. Tells her that they won't die if they eat of that tree. That God knows that in the day they eat thereof, they shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And uh, so Eve, it says, when the woman saw, Genesis 3, 6, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. And so that's Adam's, Adam disobeyed the one commandment God gave him. Uh, Adam disobeyed it. And because of that disobedience, uh, the image of God is lost. <clears throat> Remember, man was created in God's image. Well, when Adam disobeyed God, he was no longer in God's image. And uh, the image of God was lost. In Genesis 5, 3, it said, Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. Notice Adam is no longer in God's image. He's in his own likeness. And in his own image, and all his children after him are born in his image. And so man is no longer in the image of God. Uh, the only way man can have the image of God is through Jesus Christ. That image that Adam lost is being restored to us uh, through the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says that in 2 Corinthians, that we are being changed into that same image from glory to glory. Uh, Paul says, we have put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Uh, and so Adam lost the image of God. And man, from the time that Adam sinned in the garden, uh, man was no longer in God's image. So uh, Romans 5.12 says, wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. And so through Adam's disobedience, the image of God is lost in the earth. And through Adam's disobedience, sin entered into this present world. And so the whole world right now, Adam's dominion, uh, the earth that Adam was given dominion over, uh, that whole earth is now under the dominion of sin. Uh, sin took over through Adam's disobedience, and therefore Adam failed to do what God created him to do. And that was to subdue the earth. Not only that, uh, but Satan, through the disobedience of man, uh, Satan now controls the course of this world, as Paul said in Ephesians chapter two. Uh, when man sinned against God, when man disobeyed God, uh, the earth is not the the earth is no longer in subjection to God. It was not subdued uh, the way God wanted it to be, <clears throat> and because of that, Satan is now called the God of this world. 
in second corinthians chapter four he's called the god of this world and ephesians chapter two paul says <clears throat> where in time past ye walked according to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience and so we see there that the course of this world the world that you and i now live in the entire course of it uh it's government it's politics it's education its economy its wars its militaries the whole course of this world is not according to god the father it's not according to the lord jesus christ the course of this world is according to the prince of the power of the air which is satan and he is the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience meaning satan is the spirit that now works in the children of this world because of adam's disobedience and so and so here on our timeline right here we have the fall of adam right adam was created given dominion over the earth told to fill it subdue it and to and to not eat of that tree and when he disobeyed god man fell and from that point on adam we're all born in adam's image <clears throat> that <clears throat> that fallen sinful image a man no longer in the image of god he's in adam's image and through adam's disobedience sin entered into this world the 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 world that adam was uh given dominion over to bring to bring in subjection to god sin now governs this world and because of sin satan the serpent that deceived them is now the, the prince of this world and the god of this world the whole world now operates according to that prince of the power of the air and from adam to noah is what we call the old world read about that i don't have the verse up here but you can read about that in second peter chapter 2 and verse 5 uh, that god spared not the old world <clears throat> and that old world is the world from Adam to, to Noah, the world that existed prior to the flood in Noah's day. And so that's what happened after Adam's creation. Now, God in Genesis 3.15, he says something to the serpent, the one who stepped in and deceived the woman and, and brought sin into the world through disobedience. <clears throat> God tells the serpent in Genesis 3:15. Now he's talking directly to Satan here. And God tells Satan that he's going to put enmity between him and the woman. <clears throat> and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, this thing comes to its climax, to its conclusion all the way at, at the end of the Bible. Here, here, God is talking about the enmity between Satan and the woman. And we see that thing coming to its full conclusion in Revelation chapter 12, when John talks about the dragon and the woman and how there's going to be a war in heaven between Satan and his angels and Michael and his angels. And how that woman brought forth a man child who is to rule all nations. And so god makes a promise here to satan that he's going to bring a seed out of the woman and that that seed is going to bruise his head and so god makes a promise to the serpent here that he's going to destroy him and that he is going to subdue him under the feet of the seed of the woman and so this is the first uh spoken promise now remember this is about prophecy what was spoken since the world began. And this is the first spoken promise in the Bible concerning the seed of the woman and what he was going to do. And so here we see that God has a plan. Now that Satan has usurped the dominion of the earth and that he now runs the course of this world, we see here that God has a plan to destroy Satan and to, and to, uh, reestablish uh, the purpose for which man was created 
And that is he's going to bring a man child out of the woman. And that man, that seed is going to bruise the head of this serpent. And so that's God's plan in the earth is through this seed of the woman. Uh, and that, that, of course, is about the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, look over, look over in Galatians, Galatians chapter four. Galatians chapter four says, verse number four, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law we might receive the adoption of sons and so the lord jesus christ was made of a woman he was the seed of a virgin <clears throat> he was not the seed of a man he is god's son made of a woman and he came into the earth uh, one of the things he came into the earth to do is to bruise the head of satan and bring the earth back in subjection to god and so he came to he came to do what Adam failed to do, and so that's what happened uh, in the in the times of Adam. Uh, he was created. He was given a commission. He was given a commandment, and through his disobedience, the earth fell into sin, and Satan usurped the authority of the earth. But God makes a promise here concerning the seed of the woman. Now, when we come to Genesis chapter six. <clears throat> Uh, there's a plot here, Genesis chapter six, verse number two. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. And they took them wives of all which they chose. And so here's a plot of these sons of God. Now we've already looked at these sons of God in previous lessons. These are not men. Uh, they're, they're called sons of God. And they saw the daughters of men. Just notice that. sons of God, daughters of men. We're not talking about sons of men here. These are angelic beings. And if you remember, God had made a promise to bring a seed out of the woman that was going to bruise Satan's head. And so these beings now, these sons of God, have a plot to try to corrupt the seed of the woman. Uh, and so they saw, took them wives of all which they chose, and that's a plot to corrupt the seed of the woman, to try to keep uh, the son, uh, the, the, the seed that was supposed to bruise Satan's head, they're trying to corrupt the seed line so that that man child cannot be born into the world. All right. Now, Jude talks about this in Jude chapter one. Notice this. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. And so Jude tells us here that there were angels that kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. They left their own home, their own habitation, where they were supposed to be. And it says that he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness under the judgment of the great day. Now he likens these angels to Sodom and Gomorrah. In verse number seven, he says, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after, notice this now, strange flesh, so he compares these angels that he's talking about, which left their own habitation. He's comparing them to Sodom and Gomorrah, who in like manner, just like these angels, gave themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh. You see, uh, these angels committed some type of sexual immorality, just like Sodom and Gomorrah did. It's clear in the text what jude is talking about that these angels which left their first estate and and left their own habitation they 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 like sodom and gomorrah uh, went after fornication and going after strange flesh or set forth 
for an example. These angels and Sodom and Gomorrah are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. And so these angels in Noah's day, they came down and took wives of the daughters of men. And the Bible says that children were born unto them. And uh, it refers to giants being in the earth in those days. And those men become mighty men of renown. Uh, this is probably where all the heathen mythologies come from, like the Greek mythologies and the, the uh, Roman mythologies probably go back to this time of perversion when these angels uh, had children born from, from women in their attempt to, to control the earth and to keep the seed of the woman from coming and bringing the earth under subjection. Uh, they brought their own children into the world through the daughters of men, and those men became mighty men of redemption. Read about that in Genesis chapter 6. And this is why God has to bring a flood to this earth in the days of Noah, is to destroy uh, all flesh off the earth because it had become corrupt. Uh, God said all flesh had corrupted its ways before God. But we read about one man, and so. Here on the timeline, you have the sons of God over here, uh, right here around the right around the times of Noah. These sons of God begin to corrupt the the seed line of man. And I know that's some deep stuff, guys, but it's what our Bible teaches us. And uh, God now is getting ready to destroy the earth because of this, or He's getting ready to destroy all flesh on the earth. But there was one man in Genesis 6, 9. There was a man, Noah. And we we read about his generations from Adam to Noah. We read about it there in Genesis chapter 5. And it says that Noah was a just man. Notice this, and perfect in his generations. Now that perfect in his generations doesn't mean Noah was a sinless man. Or it means that his genealogy, his generations are perfect. Uh, Noah was uncorrupted uh, of these of this angelic uh, invasion into the seed line of man. Uh, when you read Genesis chapter five, you read about Noah's generation from Adam all the way down. Uh, Adam's fathers were, or Noah's fathers was Adam, Seth, Enos, Canaan, Mahalahil, uh, Jared, Enoch, Lamech, Methuselah, all the way down the line. Noah was perfect in his generations. He was untainted uh, by these sons of God in his genealogy. And because of that, not only was he perfect in his generations, he walked with God. Uh, Noah was a man of faith. Uh, we read over in Hebrews that uh, that Enoch, uh, talking about Enoch there, says that he was translated that he should not see death. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. He's, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. And it says Noah being moved with fear and all that stuff. So Noah was a man that walked with God. He was perfect in his generations, and he was a man of faith. He walked with God and and please god because he was a man of faith and so god tells noah about the flood and all this y'all know these stories but noah was noah was perfect in his generations he walked with god god warns him about the flood and so noah builds an ark uh to the saving of his household and outside of those eight souls noah his wife his three sons and his three sons' wives, God destroys the rest of all flesh from off the earth. And so uh, that's the flood. And what happened with the angelic realm trying to corrupt the seed of the woman, things of that nature. Now they come off the ark and we read about the generations of the sons of Noah. <clears throat> and this is where the nations come from. Genesis 10, 1, now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, Japheth. And unto them were sons born after the flood. And so the whole earth is repopulated 
by these three sons of Noah after the flood, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And uh, of course, we have the Tower of Babel and all this, but in Genesis 10, 32, it says, these are the families of the sons of Noah after their generations in their nations. And by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. And so these three sons of Noah uh, have sons born to them after the flood. And all these families of the sons of Noah is what becomes the nations. And God divides the earth to these nations after the flood. Uh, in Acts chapter 17, Paul preaching in Athens, Greece. You go over here and read you Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, verse, beginning in verse 22. It says, Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For I passed by and beheld your devotion. As I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship him, declare I unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything. Seeing he giveth life, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. Listen at this. And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth. And hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. And so notice that all nations come from one blood. All nations go back to Noah and his three sons. Uh, but God, God divided these nations because of what happened at the Tower of Babel. He divided these families. He divided the sons of Noah into families. And, and what a nation is in the Bible, in Genesis chapter 10, we, we read that what a nation is, is it's a family that has their own tongue. And God divided the earth to these, these families in accordance to their own language and set the boundaries of these nations. And so, and so after the flood, the families of Noah, the, the sons of Noah and their families become the nations of the earth. Uh, that's what we've got here on the timeline. These sons of Noah here on the timeline is what becomes the nations of the earth. But now let's get ready to get a little deep here for a second, guys, because a nation is more than just men and the earth. Uh, we read in Deuteronomy 32. Uh, Y'all give me a second to point this out, what's actually going on here. In, Gen in Deuteronomy 32, God tells the nation, his, his nation, right, God's nation. It says, when the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance when he separated the sons of Adam. And so when did God separate the sons of Adam? Well, he, did, he does it there in Genesis chapter 10. When he separated those, those, the earth unto those nations. And when God divided to those nations their inheritance, he set the bounds of the people. So God set boundaries to the nation. And when he's dividing, when he's dividing the earth to those nations, he sets the boundaries of those nations according to the number of the children of Israel. Meaning God had already set apart a piece of land for his people because it said, here's why. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. And so you, you, what you're reading there is that the nation of Israel is God's inheritance in the earth. That nation belongs to the Lord. And so 
we see here that 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 piece of land in the earth for Israel and the nation of Israel is God's inheritance. Well, what about the rest of the nation? Who inherited the other nation? And so what I want you to understand is that the nations of this earth are also connected to the heavenly places. Just like Israel uh, was God's nation, well, these other nations of the earth have gods in the heavenly realm over them. And this is what Deuteronomy 4 is about. Uh, God tells Israel there, lest thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the host of heaven, shouldest be driven to worship them and to serve them, which the Lord thy God hath divided unto all nations under the whole heaven. And so notice there that the nations are divided to God or, or are divided to the the, the nations are divided to the heavens. The heavens have been divided unto all nations. So not only did God divide the earth to the nations, he divided the heavens unto all nations. And so every nation on this earth is connected to something in the heavenly realm. Now the Lord's people, Israel, was his inheritance in the earth. That means in the heavenly realm, there are these sons of God that God created in heaven that he has divided the nations to them. And so when you think of a nation, you can't just think of what just the things in the earth. You have to understand that nations go all the way up to things in the heavenly realm. And so remember when we laid this out here, the order of creation, that that. God created all things in heaven and earth, both visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers. Paul tells you that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, spiritual wickedness in high places. And so, and so there are, at this present time, there are rulers in the heavenly realm that belong to this invisible realm. You can't see them but they're there and every nation. So when God divided the earth to the nations, he also divided the heavens up here to these nations as well. And so a nation goes, a nation consists of earthly thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers and heavenly thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers. I'll give you an example of this in Daniel chapter 10. Look, Flip in your Bible to Daniel 10. Uh, I don't have every verse up here, but I want you to see some things here. <laughs> Daniel chapter 10. I got to flip there myself. Now in Daniel 10 2. <clears throat> Daniel says here that he was in mourning. Uh, Daniel 10, 2, in those days, I, Daniel, three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. And so Daniel is fasting here. He's praying. And he's uh, he's praying to God about understanding visions and stuff that he had saw and then in verse 5 Daniel said I lifted up mine eyes and looked and behold a certain man clothed in linen and so there's a there's a certain man sent to Daniel to to answer his prayer at the end of 21 days he receives an answer to this prayer now look at what this man tells him in in verse uh, 11, he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, 
thy words were heard and i am come for thy words and so this man is sent to daniel because of daniel's prayer he sent to give daniel an answer but why did it take him 21 days well daniel 10 13 says the prince of the kingdom of persia withstood me 21 days but lo michael one of the chief princes came to help me and i remained there with the kings of persia so notice that uh, the, the point i'm making is that a nation is more than earthly rulers uh, we read here that a heavenly being sent to daniel to answer his prayer and the reason it took this 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 man 21 days to get to daniel is because a prince of the kingdom of persia withstood him 21 days and michael michael the archangel chief princes had to come and help him and he remained there with the kings notice that kings of persia and so persia not only had earthly kings the kingdom of persia had a heavenly prince and heavenly kings that was over that dominion and so you got to picture it now that up here in the heavenly realm daniel's down in the earth he lives in a dominion of the earth called persia and that dominion has of course an earthly king you have darius cyrus and all these men that rule down here on the earth but daniel's down here and he's fasting and up here in the heavenly realm god sends this this angel down to daniel to to answer his prayer but for 21 days there's a heavenly prince and heavenly kings up here in the heavenly realm that will stand him 21 days to try to keep him from getting to daniel and so not only are there earthly or there not only are there heavenly rulers over the nations but we see that those heavenly beings are actively engaged in withstanding the word of god they do not want the word of god uh going to the dominions of this earth uh, this is why the bible talks about christ spoiling principalities and powers there are rulers up here in the heavenly realm god has given uh dominion he's he's divided the nations uh to these heavenly places and there are rulers up here in the heavenly realm over the nations of this earth that actively withstand the word of god uh, they do not want the word of god going into their dominion uh and that that ought to that ought to that ought to scare us man that ought to terrify us to understand that about the earth that there are there are beings in the heavenly realm actively engaged in trying to keep the word of god uh out of their out of their dominions of the earth but thank god jesus christ spoiled every last one of them and the gospel went to every nation uh, of the earth and and called men out of those worlds as paul said that god delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son and so this deals with the nations of the earth we're going to get to the nation of israel here in a second but now remember what we talked about what we just uh what we talked about earlier lessons this is what psalm 82 is dealing with uh it's dealing with these gods uh that god divided the nations to and so every the nation of israel was god's nation and then all the other nations of the earth were under these gods that he's talking about in psalm 82 uh, where it says god standeth in the congregation of the mighty he judgeth among god how long will ye judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked and so we see here that these gods of the heavenly realm they judge unjustly they're unjust judges and they accept the persons of the wicked that's why when you look around the wicked prosper the wicked are rich it's the righteous that are that are judged un, uh, unjust uh, these gods of the heavenly realm the way that they govern uh, the nations 
uh, is they reward the wicked and punish the the righteous. Uh, God God tells them, this is God's plea with them. He says, defend the poor and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. That's God's plea with these beings in the heavenly realm. Listen to what he says. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. And so the, the whole foundations of the earth out of course. They the, the course of this world is according to the prince of the power of the air, the rulers of the darkness of this world. And God, God pleads with these beings, and yet he says they don't understand. They walk on in darkness, and now here's God's judgment of them. I have said, ye are gods, and all of you children of the Most High, that ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. And so notice that. God, God says that his inheritance was Israel. But here in Psalm 82, we learn that God is going to inherit all nations. And so what he's what he's going to do is he's going to judge these beings in the heavenly because of their refusal to judge righteously, their refusal to 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 judge justly and to do justice in the earth. He's going to disinherit them. They're going to they're going to die like men. They're going to fall like one of the princes. And then God is going to inherit every nation of the earth. Uh, Every nation is going to be under the God of Israel. And so after God judges the earth, he's going to inherit all nations. And so this gets into a, a little part of his heavenly plan. Uh, but just I pointed all this out so that you will understand what the nations are. These nations back here that God, that God divided the earth to the sons of Noah not only did he divide the earth, but he divided the heavens to these nations as well. And he set his children, these sons of God, he set them over these nations in the heavenly realm. And so when you think of a nation, just like Israel, uh, the nation, there was a nation in the earth that God nation. The nations of this earth are, are the same way. Uh, they is not just the earthly part there's also a heavenly part to that kingdom as well so in acts chapter 14 uh paul tells us that in times past god suffered all nations to walk in their own ways and so uh some point in time these nations uh that were formed by the sons of noah after the flood they came to a point where they didn't want to know God. That's Romans chapter one. Uh, Paul says they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. And because of that, God gave them over to the reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. And so these nations after the flood corrupted their ways. They, they did not want to know God. And so God in time past, he suffered them to walk in their own ways. And the nations were given over to ignorance. Acts 17, 30 and 31, Paul says, The times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man he, whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men that he hath raised him from the dead. And so after the flood, these nations that came from the sons of Noah uh, God suffered them to walk in their own way, and all of Gentile history, uh, every bit of Gentile history is summed up in ignorance. They did not know God. Uh, you can't look to any nation of this earth other than Israel and, and see that any nation knew God. <clears throat> you know, my, my forefathers come from Europe. And when you study the history of the European people prior to the gospel of Jesus Christ coming to Europe, uh, my European forefathers were a bunch of pagans. They were a bunch of heathen. 
that that worship gods like Thor and Zeus and 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 Hercules and Mercury and all these different mythologies. Uh, the whole the whole history of the European people prior to the Word of God coming there was they were in ignorance, and God sent the gospel to those nations. Uh, to bring those nations into repentance because God has appointed a day in which he's going to judge the world. But all the nations of the earth were ignorant of God and God gave them over to walk after their own ways. And from that point on, from Genesis chapter 12 on, the whole Bible begins to focus on one nation of people. All the other nations of the earth are given over to walk in their own ways, ignorance, uh, and now the Bible, now the Bible from Genesis chapter 12 onward, the Bible begins to focus on one family of people that, that came from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And this become known as the nation of Israel. And so God's great plan in the earth, don't, we're not talking about the heaven yet. God's great plan in the earth centers around a nation of people. Uh, that came out of Abraham. And we start reading about this in Genesis chapter 12. Uh, after God divides the earth to the nations, Genesis 12, 1 through 3 says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house. Notice Abraham is separated by God. He tells him to get out. Get thee out of thy country, kindred, and thy father's house. God is separating this man, Abram. And he tells him to get unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation. And so now we're starting to read about why God is separating them. He says, come out from among your own people. Come to this land that I'm going to show you. And now look at what he says he's. I will make of thee a great nation. And so God now has a plan to make a great nation uh, out of Abraham, out of Abram. And not only is he going to make of him a great nation, bless him. He's going to make his name great and he shall be a blessing. He's going to make Abraham a blessing to all people. And so he's going to make this great nation, bless it. And then that nation is going to become a blessing to people. Uh, he says, I will bless them that bless thee, curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. All those families that God just described in Genesis chapter 10 that make up the nations of the earth, God now has a plan to bless all these families of the earth through this one nation that he's going to make out of Abraham. And so God, we see here that God has, has a plan to make a great nation in the earth and to make that nation a blessing to all the families of earth. So this is about God's, notice these words, we're talking about God's twofold plan. Notice this, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. This has nothing to do with the heavenly plan yet. This is all about what God's plan is in the earth. And so just understand that God's plan in the earth is to make uh, a great nation and to make that nation a blessing to all families of the earth. All right. Uh, Genesis 15, 18. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abel, saying unto thy seed, have I given this land and so this has to do with a piece of land in the earth you and i are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places our inheritance is in heaven but here we're reading about a promise to abraham to give his seed a piece of land from the river of egypt Unto the great river, the river Euphrates. This is about, this is the earth here. And so God is going to make a great nation. And he has set apart a piece of land for that great nation. 
And right here we have a map of where that land is. Uh, as we see here, if you take the boundaries of the land of Israel, that there's a piece of land that God has promised to Abraham. And I don't know if you guys can see my arrow on the screen or not, but right here, right smack that in the middle of our, this nation Iraq here is a river that runs through it. That's the river Euphrates. And over here, running on the coast of Egypt over here is the great river of Egypt. And from that river of Egypt to this river Euphrates is the land that God promised Abraham and his seed. And so as you see, just looking at that map, there are people in that land that shouldn't be there. You got half of Iraq, Syria, this nation of Jordan, which wasn't a nation prior to uh, the end of World War I. Over here, you've got Lebanon. You've got the Gaza Strip. All this, all this land is being fought over. And God has, God has already made a covenant with Abraham and made a promise to Abraham that he's going to give that land to this great nation uh, that's going to come out of Abraham. And so that, that land belongs. Now, God has kicked them out, scattered them among the nations, but one of these days, God is going to gather his people into that land over there, and he's going to give that land to the nation that he promised it to. And so all this deals with God's plan of the earth. God is going to make a great nation, set that great nation in this land. And later on, under the Davidic covenant, when we get to it, this city right here on this map called Jerusalem, God has chosen that city to be the, the place of his throne. And out of that city, his law is going to go forth unto all nations of the earth. And all the nations of the earth is going to learn the righteousness and the law of God from the nation of Israel. And so one of these days, this great nation that God is going to make in the earth, the nation of Israel is going to become a light to all the nations of the earth. And out of Jerusalem, God is going to govern the earth. His son is going to govern the earth uh, out of the throne of his father, David, there in Jerusalem getting a little ahead of our uh, the Davidic the, the promises made to David but I just want you to understand that this deals with God's plan to reconcile the earth back to himself to bring all nations uh, under subjection to him and God is going to bless all the nations of the earth through this nation of Israel uh, once he brings them back into that land and establishes their kingdom the kingdom that he promised them, uh, that nation is going to become a blessing to all nations. And so in Genesis chapter 17 now, uh, God tells Abraham, this is my covenant. This is after God changes his name from Abram to Abraham. And he tells Abraham, this is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be. And so that's the, the, the covenant people of God, the circumcision, right? And this will be important when you come into the New Testament. And Paul talks about the gospel of the uncircumcision and the gospel of the circumcision. Um, God set this people up here apart through circumcision. They become known as the circumcision. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2 that we, in time past, were Gentiles and that we are called the uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision. And then he says, at that time we were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. 
And so this people up here, this circumcised people that come from Abraham were set apart by God for a special purpose in the earth. Uh, they become known as the circumcision. Now, thank God, God had a plan for the heavens also part of. But that, that circumcision was set apart by God uh, for his own purpose in the earth. The nations were given up. The nations were given over. God says, go in your own ways. Go do whatever you want to do. Then he labor says, I'm going to make of you a great nation. I'm going to give your, I'm going to give your seed, your children, this land. And then he tells Abraham to circumcise himself and his children and that circumcised people were set apart for God uh, for his special purpose in the earth now that lineage goes from Abraham Ishmael is cast out it says cast out the bond woman and her child the inheritance goes to Isaac so it goes Abraham Isaac and then God chooses Jacob over Esau. He changes Jacob's name to Israel over there in the book of Genesis. I'm sure y'all have read that after he wrestles with the angel. God changes Jacob's name to Israel. And Jacob had 12 sons, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Dan, Naphtali. Uh, you read about them there in the book of Genesis. 12 sons become known as the house of Israel. Uh, these 12 sons are the 12 sons of Israel and those 12 families that came out of Jacob or Israel become the house of Israel. Uh, look at Genesis chapter 46 and then we'll move on to Exodus. I'm running out of time. We'll get as far as we can and we'll pick up with the rest of this stuff here in a couple of weeks. But look at Genesis chapter 46. Joseph is already down in Egypt and he calls for uh, they find out that jo Joseph is alive and God appears to Jacob in Genesis 46 verse number two God spake unto Israel in the visions of the night and said Jacob Jacob and he said here am I and this is what God says to Jacob. And he said, I am God, the God of thy father. Fear not to go down into Egypt, for I will there make of thee a great nation. And so remember the promise to Abraham that he was going to make of Abraham a great nation. And God tells Jacob before he goes to Egypt not to be fearful of going to Egypt, because God is going to make him a great nation in Egypt. And so this takes you to the book of Exodus, where that great nation uh, has been created by God there in Egypt. And God is now getting ready to call that nation out of Egypt. And so the great nation, this takes us up to the book of Exodus now, but you had Abraham, Isaac, Jacob becomes Israel, and Jacob's 12 sons become the house of Israel or the nation of Israel. And these 12 sons and their families go down into Egypt at the end of Genesis, and they are greatly multiplied and become a great and mighty people in the land of Egypt. And they become so mighty, so numerous, so uh, such a mass of people that the Egyptians take them and put them in bondage and slavery. And so now God sends Moses down to Egypt in Exodus chapter 4, and he tells Moses to say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And so what does that mean? It means Israel, the nation of Israel, is God's heir. God has chosen that people to be an inheritance, to receive an inheritance and to be his son and his firstborn. And then he tells Moses, tell Pharaoh to let my son go that he may serve me. You see, 
God has a purpose for the nation of Israel. They're his son, his heir, his firstborn. And he tells Pharaoh, let my son go so that my son can serve me. And then he tells them, if you won't, then I'm going to kill your firstborn. And so all this is spoken right there at the very beginning. And so God, <clears throat> what we see here is that this nation of Israel it has been created by God to serve him. They have a purpose in the earth. And so Pharaoh's got them in bondage, and God says, let them go so that they can serve me. Uh, when we come to Exodus chapter 15, after, after God brings the plagues on Egypt and he redeems the nation of Israel, and go through the Passover and the Red Sea. Notice what Moses says here in Exodus 15, 13. He says, thou and thy mercy has led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. That's Israel. They, they were a people redeemed by God. He says, thou hast guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. So God redeemed this people and he's guiding them unto his holy habitation. They, they are they are being they've been brought out of Egypt and God is taking them into that land that God has set apart to be his holy house, his holy dwelling place. Uh, Exodus 15, 17 and 18, he says that bring them in and plant them in the mountain of thine inheritance in the place, O Lord, which thou hast made for thee to dwell in in the sanctuary, O Lord, which hands established the lord shall reign forever and ever and so this takes us back to the land again in fact it's interesting that this is spoken in exodus 15 18 dealing with this land because that's god made the covenant with abraham about the land in genesis 15 18 but it goes back to the land again and so israel was down here in Egypt. god goes down he redeems them he brings them out of Egypt and he's bringing them to this land that he promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And this land has been set apart by God to be the dwelling place of his people and to be become a holy, it was, it was to be a holy nation. Unto God. Uh, God is going, God's purpose was to establish a holy nation in that land a people that were set apart by him to serve him. And God is going to, uh, God's plan is to, is, to, is to rule all nations through that holy nation there. Uh, look at Exodus 19. I don't know why I didn't put this one up, but look at Exodus 19. In Exodus 19, God brings that people that he redeemed to Mount Sinai. And in Exodus 19 and 5, well, let's start in verse 4. He says, you have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagles wings and brought you unto myself. And so God's telling Israel here, you've seen what I did. I brought you to myself. I set you apart for myself. Now, therefore, if you will obey my deed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And so God tells them now that he, he, he redeemed them, he brought them to himself, and now he tells them if they will obey his voice and do what he tells them to do, they will be a special people unto him. They will become a kingdom of priests and they will be a holy nation. And so God's purpose for that people was to make them a holy nation in the earth. They're his, they're his firstborn. And so here on the timeline, you have Israel, the firstborn of God, God's people of inheritance. They're redeemed from Egypt. And then 
up here at Exodus 19, they're given the law of Moses. They enter into a covenant with God uh, called the law, the law covenant or the, the, the law of Moses. However, we read in Romans 4.13 that the promise to Abraham that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. You see, God made promises to Abraham and to his seed before he ever gave the law. And so Israel, Israel's inheritance was not based on the righteousness of the law, it was based on the righteousness of faith. And Paul tells you that the law, in Galatians 3.24, he tells you that the law was only a schoolmaster to bring Israel unto Christ that they might be justified by faith. And so keep that in mind as you as you think about the law. God knew when Israel off when he when he gave Israel that law, they were not going to keep that law. That law was a schoolmaster to bring those people unto Christ. And so uh Israel comes out of Egypt, they are God's son, but under Moses, he put them under a schoolmaster. They're his heirs. The nation of Israel is his heirs but they're not ready to be sons yet. They're like children. And Paul deals with this stuff in Galatians chapter four. Ain't we, we ain't got time to get into that this morning, but he basically says there that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. And so, right. But God took these people, he redeemed them. And then he put them under the law as a schoolmaster until the time that Jesus Christ came to redeem them from the law that they might receive the adoption of sons. And Paul deals with this stuff in Galatians 4. That's not the point right now. Um, I'm going to have to close with this section right here, and this is where we'll pick up next time, guys. Um, Leviticus chapter 26. This people set apart by God. I hope y'all followed this. This stuff's very important. This is about God's plan in the earth. Um, when you come to Leviticus chapter 26, God speaks to the nation of Israel here. Uh, he tells Moses to tell, to write these things unto them and teach these things to them. <clears throat> and this nation that is now under the law of God given that law and under that covenant, God tells them that if they obey him, he will bless them. But he tells them that if they disobey him, he's going to punish them. And he's going to curse them for disobedience. And over in Leviticus chapter 26, beginning in verse 14, this guys, this is this stuff right here is going to help you understand the rest of the Old Testament moving forward. It's going to explain all that history from Joshua all the way through Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. It's going to help you understand what the prophets are talking about. It's going to help you understand what Daniel's prayer is in Daniel chapter 9. Uh, Israel, is, Israel is under a covenant. And God tells them that if they disobey him, that he was going to punish them. Uh, from verse 14 through 17, we read about the first course of punishment. And basically what God told them is if they, that if they wouldn't obey him, then their enemies would rule over them. Then he tells them if they still won't listen, that he's going to punish them seven times more. And that's found in 18 through 20. And there he talks about uh, uh, punishing the land. In other words, he's going to shut up the heavens. The, the, the land will become desolate. It won't be a fruitful land. Uh, that land was supposed to be a land that flowed with milk and honey, but because of Israel's disobedience, God cursed that land. He, he made that land desolate because of their sin. And so first punishment, your enemies are going to reign over you. Second punishment, your land will not yield her increase. Your land will not bring forth fruit unto you. 
Then he tells them if they still won't obey him in verse 21 through 22, if they still won't obey him, he's going to punish them more. <clears throat> and he says here that he's going to send wild beasts into the land to rob them of their children. And guys, these, these are the same punishments that you read about in the book of Revelation. Famine, sword, uh, the beast of the field. God says the over there that a, a, a fourth of mankind, these, these are always the ways God punishes. Is he, he brings famine and pestilence. He brings wild beasts, and then he brings war. And so God, these, this is consistent throughout the Bible. And so Leviticus 26, he said, I'll send beasts among you which shall rob you of your children and destroy your cattle. He said, these ravenous beasts will come in and destroy your flocks and your herds and even rob you of your children. Then he says, if you still won't obey me, I'll punish you even more for your sin. And then he talks about, from verse 23 through 26, he talks about bringing a sword into the land of Israel, warfare. And then he says, if you still won't obey me, verse 27 through 39, if you still will not obey me, then I'm going to punish you seven times more. And this time he said he would kick them out of the land. He would scatter them among the heathen and that they would utterly waste away in the lands of their enemies. Uh, that he would scatter them among the heathen, that they would perish among the heathen. But in verse 40 of Leviticus, all the way down, he, re he, he, he reinstates that if at, at any time, if they confess their iniquity, that he will remember his covenant with Jacob and Isaac and Abraham. And so even though Israel disobeyed the law and God punished them, the promises he made to them are still good. He is still going to do what he promised he was going to do. That's why Paul says in, in Romans chapter 11 uh, uh, that the promises of God are without repentance. That Israel to this day, even though they are enemies uh, to the gospel, Paul says they are still beloved for the Father's sake. For the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. God is going to do what he promised he was going to do with the nation of Israel. Uh, all the promises that he made uh, concerning Israel, the land, the great nation, making them a blessing to all nations, uh, making them a holy nation, all that stuff is still going to happen. It's going to happen under a new covenant. He's going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. But here under the old covenant, uh, that old covenant was like a schoolmaster. It was a teacher. And, and they were punished under that law because of their disobedience. And that's what you're reading about from the book of Joshua onward. Uh, the book of Joshua records Israel uh, going in to take possession of the land that was promised to their fathers. And from that point on, the rest of that history from the book of Judges onward is about Israel in the land, their disobedience to God under that covenant and God's punishment of that people. Uh, the, the, as, as you see here on the timeline, uh, the, for, the first course of punishment uh, where God said their enemies would reign over them, that begins in the book of Judges. Israel disobeyed God and he put them under uh, the Midianites. Then they repented and God delivered them. And then they disobeyed again and he put them under the Philistines. And so every time, all throughout the book of Judges, every time they disobeyed God, God put them, he, he put them under the rulership of their enemies until they repented. And this actually, when you get over and read it, it's been a, been a while since I've looked at this, but I'm almost positive there's seven uh, distinct periods there in the book of Judges that God puts Israel under their enemies. Uh, and so that's the first course of punishment. Uh, after the book of Judges, Israel asks for a king, and then God gives them Saul. Uh, 
Saul's a wicked king, and then God anoints David, and this begins the Davidic kingdom. And that's where we'll pick up next week is with the, the, the kingdom of David and the promises made uh, to the son of David, the seed of David, uh, which, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, next, next time, guys, we're going to get more into these courses of punishment and, and lead into the mystery. Uh, but uh, we, got, we still got some stuff to look at here, guys. I got a lot here on the timeline. Uh, every one of those things God said he would punish them for, All every one of these come to pass. Their enemies rule over them and the judge. There in the days of Elijah, God shuts up the heavens and sends famine into the land, just like he said he would do. In the days of Elisha, we read that that bears come out of the woods and devoured their children, just like he said it would. And then beginning there in the times of Isaiah, uh, we read about the Assyrian coming into the land, Sennacherib. And he brings warfare and conquers the cities of Israel and carries most of them away captive. Judah spared. And then uh, a little bit later, the Babylonians come in and destroy what's left of the nation. And all of Judah and Israel are cast out of that land. God, God, God meant what he said back here. None of these things is about the Gentiles. This is about God's nation, Israel. And God has a purpose for that people in the earth, but he put that people under the law as a schoolmaster to bring them to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ when he come. And so throughout their history, uh, they were punished multiple times because of their disobedience to God. And that'll take us up to the book of Daniel and the times of the Gentiles and 70 weeks. And we'll get into all that next time. And then we'll lead into the mystery of our dispensation. Uh, we have not been chosen by God to replace Israel. God is still going to do. He's still going to establish the nation of Israel and the earth. You and I were chosen by God in Christ uh, through the gospel to, to reconcile the heavenly places unto God. Our inheritance is in heaven. And, and Israel in the earth and us in heaven make up the whole family of God and God is going to use his people in both realms to reconcile all things back to himself.